सहनावतु सहन भुन सह वीर करवाहै तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मेद्वेशावै ओ शांति 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 We shall chant verses twenty one till the end. Bhajago vindam, bhajago vindam, go vindam, bhaja mudhamate, samprapte san nihite kale, nahi nahi rakshati dukrin karane. Punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi janani jathare shayanam. Iha samsare, bahudustare, kripaya pare, pahi murare. Rathya charpata, virachita kanthaha, punya punyavi. वर्जित पंथ योगी योगनी योजित चेतो रमते बालोन मतव देवा कस्तम कोहम कुत आयात कामे जननी को मे इति परिभावय सर्वमसारम विश्व त्यक्वा स्वप्न विचार मयी चान्यको विष्णु व्यर्थ कोप्यसी मय्यस हेष्णु भव सचिवाचिरा ध्यदि विष्णु शत्रौ मित्र त्रे पुत्रे बंध मन विग्रह सर्वस्मिन्नपि पश्यात्मात्सृज भेदा काम क्रोधम लोभम मोहम त्यक्वात्मा पश्यति सोहम आत्मज्ञानवीना मूढ़ा ते पच्यंते नरक निगूढ़ा गेय गीता नाम सहस्रम ध्येय श्रीपति रूपमजस्रम ने सज्जन संघे चेत देय दीनज सुखत क्रियते राोग पश्चाधंतरे रोग यद्यपि लोके मरण शरण तदपी न मुंचति पापाचरण आर्थमनाथ भावय नि नास्ति तत सुख क्लेश सत्यम पुत्रादि धन भाजा भीति विहिता रीति प्राणायाम प्रत्याहार निवेक विचार जाप्य समेत स माधि विधान कुर्वधान महदवधान गुरुचरणुज निर्भर भक्त संसाराद्यचि 
राघव मुक्त सेंद्रिय मानस निव द्रक्षसी निज हृदय स्थम देव भज गोविंद भज गोविंद गोविंद भज मूढ़मते संप्राप्ते सन् निहिते काले नहीं नहीं रक्षति करने नहीं नहीं रक्षति करने नहीं नहीं रक्षति करने The last we did was the famous twenty-ninth verse, where the guru summarizingly captures how we have to relate with wealth, giving us the potential danger, imminent danger, in not knowing how to relate with wealth. Artham anartham bhavayanityam. Wealth is calamitous, isn't it? We learn that wealth is calamitous. There is not the least happiness from it. There is no way you will be able to draw happiness, which is a a superior quotient, a superior mental quotient from anything that is gross material. The wealthy even fear their own son. this is how it is ordained everywhere so wealth per se is nothing right or wrong it is your own relationship with wealth that all that matters and that is so beautifully personified on one side you worship god as lakshmi and on other side you have he says wealth is a calamity so is wealth a blessing or a curse it depends on your relationship with wealth but if you know the uh, as you understand that god is lakshmi the concert of lord vishnu and lakshmi is always serving lord vishnu she is at the feet of the lord serving the lord similarly the wealth must always be used to serve a larger purpose a higher cause a greater interest the moment the wealth you acquire is served to satisfy your own unending insatiable thirst for aggrandizing more and more as long as it does not have a loftier goal or an ideal or a purpose wealth becomes a curse as the famous words of oliver goldsmith he said that where wealth accumulates men decay we we have studied that where wealth accumulates men decay you 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 wealth gives you access to sensual indulgences and where there is sensual indulgence where you glorify carnal pleasures there is no atmosphere for the higher values to generate which you will see exactly the contrary of it in the the last uh, couple of verses which we are going to get on to today okay so this is what we concluded with last week we shall chant the 30th verse pranayama pratyaharam nityanetya ve veka vicharam जाप्य समेत सधिविधान कुर्वधान महधवधान प्राणायाम प्रत्याहार निनेक विचार जाप्य समेत सधिविधान कुर्वधान mahadavadhanam
So as you see, this verse is titled the Antaranga Sadhana, the internal spiritual disciplines. Now what the translation reads, Pranayamam refers to the regulation of pranas, which are your life's activities. Pratyaharam, sense withdrawal, withdrawal from any sensual activity. Nitya Nitya Viveka Vicharam, reflect on the distinction between the nitya and anitya, the permanent and the impermanent. Japya sameta samadhividhanam, the practice of chanting and silencing of the mind. Kurvavadhanam, mahadavadhanam, practice these with care, perform these with care, with great care. I shall explain this in detail, but the very consoling and comforting words from the Guru to ensure that you practice this with great care. Now, as I've said, the Guru comes back having heard his disciples say what they have understood. The last four verses are attributed to Adi Shankara Acharya. Uh, can we have the main screen back, Chi? So the last four verses are attributed to the Guru. So the 28th and the 29th verses, the Guru has actually demolished the two primary objectives of the purpose of mankind. The two primary objectives which every individual is running behind is acquisition and enjoyment. Entire life they're running behind acquiring and wanting to enjoy what they've acquired. Acquisition is measured with Kanjana and enjoyment is measured with harmony or symbolized rather is measure is symbolized with wealth and woman. So he has demolished these two pursuits, having understood the futility of that. In fact, only when some of us have understood the futility of these pursuits, then only you can embark on the higher, you know, when you introduce this knowledge to certain people, some people very, very politely say, I am not yet ready for this knowledge. When I'm ready, I will come to it. What do they mean? They are still interested in what the world has to offer. They're not interested in anything higher. They're running behind the worldly activities. So if that be the case, the least you can do is let them be in their own chase and pursuit. You know, unless and until you understand the futility of your pursuit, you will not turn your life your attention on the way. So till then you can't do much. <laughs> you think so, Srimatima? <laughs> They're only going through circles. They're only going through cycles. Circles and circles going round and round. They go nowhere, believe me or not. They don't realize that. They're just going nowhere. It doesn't lead them anywhere closer to the truth. They're just having, making a fool of themselves. That's all I can say. In fact, the spiritual masters look upon them and say, Bala, children, how long will you be entertaining yourself with those childhood, childish entertainment? Carry on. Someday you'll grow up. And when you grow up, you will turn your way this way. You know? So they're very considerate. They're very accommodative. They don't. In fact, one of the traits of a wise man, which you and I should be very mindful, a wise man is one who would never unsettle the minds of the ignorant. Remember that you should never ever push these higher impressions, these higher values onto those who don't appreciate it yet. It took a while for you to grow in maturity to appreciate what these values are, isn't it? Have you been able to appreciate from the day one? Me. It took a while. Were you also not one amongst the, the ignoramuses, the masses running behind external fascinations? It took certain maturity, certain experience, a certain understanding to draw you inward. So also you must understand, you must leave them to be in their own pursuit of their own passions and fascinations of the world. You should never unsettle them. And if you, in your anxiety to pass this knowledge to them, if you unsettle them, it's going to only boomerang, backlash. It's not going to serve you well. Okay, so, this knowledge will serve well those who understood the futility, which is already established in 28, 29. Now here he says, firstly says, 
pranayamam now what does the word pranayama you don't need any introduction of what pranayama is it is such a bombarded term today in the name of spirituality today spirituality is nothing but pranayama there is a wholesale pranayama going on globally so so the gurus out there have literally taken out this word pranayama and marketing it in a such a fantastic way and they have facts and figures to prove that it will produce results and they are going on i am nothing against it but it's just one aspect of spiritual exercise for god's sake please don't take the part and call it the whole that is what the gurus are doing out there the two extremities of spirituality is either pranayama or meditation i will not hold back what the truth is the truth has to be spoken you may reject it you may banish it you may ban me but this is what the extremities of spirituality are being marketed out there with a great flourish the two extremities are pranayama which is a mere physical exercise which they attribute a greater spiritual bearing i don't think so at the same time meditation is also being marketed i am not surprised more than half of you in this classroom would have would be sold to that thought would be practitioners if not gurus yourself and my humble salutations and prostrations to your knowledge and wisdom i am not here to challenge anyone my job is to just convey what the truth is so when they use the word pranayama now why is the, the the you know the five physiological functions the prana apana samana vyana udana the five physiological functions prana is nothing but perception apana is excretion samana is digestion vyana is circulation and udana is thought absorption these are the five physiological functions prana apana samana vyana udana i am sure you know them how many of you are not aware of it you want to take a note of it raise your hand for your sake i shall spell it out okay um right so um harish ji could you just type it out for me is it convenient for you so prana is perception the perception refers to the perception of sight sound smell taste touch the five perceptions prana so prana is just not breath prana refers to all the five perceptions but they only glorify the perception of breathing in anulon vilon pranayama that pranayama this pranayama kapala bhati and hey i am not just making a joke of it every day i myself do it and i know the benefits of it i'll explain further this all pranayama is not just mere breath it controls the five perception prana means okay and then apana is excretion the five physiological functions at the physical level they all realm of the body so apana is excretion samana is digestion vyana v y a n a vyana is circulation and then udana is thought absorption these are the five physiological functions and breath is just one of the pranas so these are the involuntary actions of the body which has to be regulated and controlled now why they have to be regulated and controlled so that the physical body doesn't interfere in your spiritual journey so when you do all these when you regulate not just your breath you regulate all your five pranas what happens your physical body gets energized now you may be we we breathe 24 hours even in your sleep you are breathing but that doesn't give you health but anything controlled and measured and regulated gives you health so what is pranayama controlled breath conscious breath most of the times you are not even conscious you are breathing 
until I ask you now, are you, do, are you aware you're breathing now? You're not aware. Oh, is it? Yes, sir. No. Eh, what? You will only know that you're breathing when there's a funny smell. Something is, uh, something is fishy, something is foul, or something is being made in the kitchen. Ah, what is that smell? That's when you realize you're breathing. Otherwise, you don't even realize. So you're not conscious. These are involuntary functions. All right. Now, now that there's a connection between calming of the mind and the breath. When your mind is calm, your breath is measured, is balanced. You got to understand this connection. When your mind is calm, your breath is balanced and controlled. Now, what everybody is doing, they are saying you can control the mind by measuring and controlling the breath. This is a logical fallacy. I will stand against any guru out there with utter humility and, and try to learn and understand their wisdom. Because the Shastras are saying exactly contrary to what is being marketed out there. They believe and they say that by doing pranayama you can control the breath. It is by control the mind. I'm sorry, it is not possible. It is not possible to control the mind directly by controlling the breath. Yet the breath is only conducive for the mind. You must know the two differences. The difference between conduciveness vis-a-vis -vis control. I give an example. You need a conducive soil to plant a seed, isn't it? But when you get a healthy fruit, you can't attribute the fruit to the soil, do you? What do you attribute the quality of the, seed, uh, the fruit to? To the quality of the seed, not to the soil. And yet the seed would not have sprouted if there was no conducive soil. Fair enough. But to go to the extent and say the seed, sorry, the fruit is responsible because of the soil is a bit too much. And this is what the spiritual gurus out there are doing. They are bringing down spirituality to just control of your breath, which is not so. And it is not possible to directly control the mind and what the mind throws at you through pranayama. Now, quickly, can I ask you all, what does the, what, what constitutes the mind? If some of you have been attending other sessions, you will have gathered it. What are the, what are the different aspects of the mind? Yes, your mind consists of emotions, impulsive thoughts. Impulsive means they're non-rational. Some thought, random thought comes into your mind. Your mind entertains many such irrational, impulsive thoughts. Mind consists of desires, perfect. What else mind consists of? Yes, I've mentioned indiscriminate thoughts and desires. Your mind consists of various feelings. Feelings like all the positive and the negative feelings. Now also getting to know that VRK is Ushama. <laughs> so your mind consists of all the negative jealousy, greed, love, hatred, compassion, kindness, charity, pity, the whole gamut of emotions that your mind entertains. Uh, the complexes your mind gets into, uh, the, the likes and dislikes. Intellect is not the mind. The mind, intellect is different. So the mind consists of emotions, feelings, uh, impulses, indiscriminate thoughts, likes and dislikes, desires, attachments. Now tell me, you can conquer all these things through mere breath? Don't be joking. It's a big joke out there. Spirituality is a big joke out there. I don't mind being banished for life. I'll yet speak the truth from the deep caves so that the sound can be heard reverberating from the bowels of the cave. You cannot conquer an inch of the mind through breath. 
it is just an environment it lends a charm that's about all you are overselling a product which is not worth it and you are all falling and buying for it because you are falling for the mere charm of it it's just a charm so also is meditation just a charm if anybody comes and says i have meditated for half an hour i laugh within like a small child laughing within i laugh myself externally i have deep deep respect for others but internally i'm laughing at myself it's the biggest joke and i am no way sitting and challenging anybody out there please i am that's not my intention because you will see what the sadhana is he just starts off by saying start with pratyahara this refers to karma yoga because it involves the physical body it involves the physical body the breath therefore it talks it as the karma yoga in broad now i should clarify this why can't breath directly control all the aspects of the mind i just mentioned your mind is also very selfish yes selfishness none of this can be addressed by the breath because breath is gross mind is subtle anything gross cannot control the subtle this is a law of life you can't tamper with these laws and we can't commit that sin of trying to change these laws anything gross cannot control subtle in fact other way around when you are mentally agitated you see your breath goes out of control isn't it when you are fearful of something your breath goes out of control when you know you have done something wrong and you are being pulled up your breath goes out of control your physical body you start sweating you start palpitating you start shivering all these physical symptoms are expressions of mind is imbalance but just because you have a healthy body that does not mean you have a healthy mind i know people who are in their pink of health but yet they have serious addictions they have serious concerns their mind is in a neurotic state what are we talking in the bhagavad gita you had a great warrior a warrior a successful soldier perhaps you can say he was the bahubali of his time he had such a physique he had such strength he had such success and yet his mind went through horripilations he couldn't control his emotions he, he was shivering he couldn't hold the bow and arrow he put his bow and arrow and fight lord krishna didn't tell him let's both do pranayama in the battlefield he taught him the bhagavad gita he taught him the shastras he taught him the sanatana dharma today's gurus are saying let's all sit together mastly let's let's meditate and do pranayama ridiculous don't be joking you can't just give one aspect of truth and say this is the entire truth it is not the entire truth you are only talking the part of the truth let's accept it and the shastras are very very vehemently declaring this truth this is not adi shankaracharya is just explaining what the vedas are saying if you have time and patience and capacity to go into the bowels of this literature please find out i am not challenging anyone i am only trying to mention what is laid out there so that you can take an independent inquiry take an independent inquiry and find out what the truth is don't be sold to any gurus out there which is what the next verse says guru is certainly important but don't be slaves to some gurus out there you got to have the capacity to question and understand the truth for what it's worth don't just blindly ape what is being said out there second important spiritual internal sadhana he says is pratyaharam pratyaharam is nothing but withdrawal from sensual activities of the world withdraw your mind from the world first pranayama is at the physical level regulation of your pranas not just breath all the five pranas and all the five physiological functions i repeat pranayama refers to the physical level control all the five pranas which is what are the five pranas all the five perceptions hearing smelling tasting touching seeing all these under prana regulate all of them and the five physiological functions so all of them so an entire gamut of the physiological functions must be regulated refers to karma yoga second mentally withdrawing from the world is known as pratyahara pratyahara is withdrawing your mind from the sensual activity now you have got such a attraction and affinity and love for the world that all your mental energies and resources are invested in the world isn't it 
So you've got to withdraw your capital from the worldly fascinations. All your capital, where is your capital? Huh? Where is your mental capital? So who will answer this question? Bhaskar Digaru. I hope you are able to follow the, the line of thought. My question is, where are you invested your capital? Mental capital. Thank you. Thank you. I'm yes, following. Sir. sir, I only way I know you're following is by answering the question. <laughs> Where are you investing your mental capital, sir? I'm not asking your material capital. Huh? Is I am not interested in that. I'm asking your mental capital. Because of COVID, we are investing in ourselves now. Otherwise, it would have gone somewhere else. <laughs> That's interesting. That's nice. <laughs> so it's a blessing. COVID is a blessing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Right. Most welcome, sir. In fact, if we if we don't if we are not conscious, in fact, if you realize how things are going, majority of our mind is consumed and fascinated with the outside world. We are just Joe so caught up and enchanted by all that the world has to offer. And at different stages, Bala Stavat Krida Saktaha, Taruna Stavat Taruni Saktaha, Vridha Stavat Chinta Saktaha, Parame Brahmani Kopina Saktaha. Lord is saying, which is an earlier verse of the Vajagovindam, he says, hardly anybody has time for me. As a child, he's lost in the toy world. As a youth, all your life, you're chasing some passion of yours. As an old man, you're caught up in your own engagements. You gloat at your own achievements of your children and your grandchildren and your own worries about their well-being. Nothing else interests you. Nothing else matters you. As if you're the only one who has got a child and a grandchild. Huh? What a world you're caught up in. That's all your world. That's all that entertains you and fascinates you. You can't think of anything higher. Parame Brahmani Kopina Sakta. So you've got to withdraw your mental capital. You're investing your love for the world. Withdraw your love from the world and redirect it to something higher. And that is known as Bhakti Yoga. Bhakti Yoga is nothing but falling in love for the Lord. Your feelings which have gone for the world, you must start feeling for the higher. So when your emotion which is developed an attachment to the lower, when it's redirected to something higher, it becomes devotion. As I've always said, the emotion is the same. The emotion between love and devotion is the same emotion. When your emotion is directed to lower, it is love. When it's directed to something beyond your little self to the higher, it becomes devotion. So that is only possible by withdrawing your world from the, sorry, withdrawing your mind from the worldly activities. You are very much in the world, but my mind is not carried away by the worldly fascinations. Then only you are in love with the Lord. That is bhakti. So the second internal discipline, the sadhana you got to practice is pratyaharam. It is not taught out there. It is only contained in textbooks. And when you tap textbooks like this, it brings out. The third is Jnana Yoga, Nitya Nitya Viveka Vicharam. The real capacity of Jnanam, you want to measure how much Jnanam you have, how much wisdom you have is measured by this quality. The distinction between the impermanent and the permanent. First and foremost, you must distinguish. Is this permanent? Is this impermanent? In fact, I, I could quickly sum it up. The story goes after Hanuman, you know, after, at the end of Ramayana. The story goes, Hanuman played such a pivotal role in the reunion of Sita and Rama. So there was a reunion and there was a grand celebration, re-coronation of Rama. And Sita, his consort, was sitting next to him. And Hanuman, as usual, was kneeled down with his palms folded. He was looking up to the Lord, Lord Rama and Sita, with utter reverence and respect and devotion. Sita was so impressed. She had never seen such a devotion. His devotion was unparalleled. 
she was so touched by the devotion and seva. In fact, you can only serve where there's devotion. Understand this. You serve your family because you have a love for your family. You will give anything for the sake of the family because you have a love for them, isn't it? Would you calculate how much you have given to your own children and grandchildren? Would you? Would you calculate? Would you, would you try accounting with your own grandchildren or your own uh, love being, whomever you have love for? No. So also you would never calculate your devotion to the higher. Wherever you're devoted, that, that pure emotion flows. Then that's when you serve. You serve how much you serve. You, you give all what you can give. And that's what Hanuman did. And Sita was so mighty impressed with what Hanuman did. For all what Rama wanted was Sita back in his life. And he gave everything he had for the reunion. And story goes, Sita was so impressed in front of Sabha, in front of everyone in the, in the, in the, in the gathering. She took out a necklace and gave it to him. And there are various interpretations to the stories. I'm not going into the story. Some may say different versions of it. But the story goes, she, he just took the, that necklace and he put it near his ear. And it did not remind him of Rama. It did not resonate of the truth of the Rama he was sold by. The story goes, he just chucked the, the necklace in front of Sabha, in front of everyone, he, he chucked it away. And the necklace was broken into bits and pieces and scattered everywhere. And then somebody took objection, something with such motherly love, Sita Ma gave to you and then you are such disrespectful, you, you don't do that, do you? Whatever comes your way, you receive with great grace and dignity, isn't it? You give me one rupee, I will receive with dignity because you have given with love. How should I quantify? Why should I quantify it? You are not quantifying it. I only see your, your love in it. So I will receive it with grace. But what Hanuman did in public square, in open, in front of everyone, was unacceptable. And when he was pulled up for that act, Hanuman ripped open, he like, tore his chest and said, Sita is right within me. Rama and Sita and Lakshmana are within me. And that's what you find in many Hanuman temples, isn't it? Hanuman tore open his chest and said, you are only looking at it objectively. Every core, every part of me, every, every ounce, every nerve, every blood, every drop of blood, I am Rama in it. Rama is very much in me. See, that is the identification Hanuman had. Now, what that I'm trying to draw a connection here is Hanuman symbolizes, even though we talk Hanuman as a great bhakta, but you can see profound jnanam in his act. What he did, he attuned to this one thought of Rama. Anything other than Rama, he did not identify with it. So, jnanam is measured by the capacity to distinguish between nitya and anitya. What is eternal? What is ephemeral? Uh, how, not how many books you have read, how much shastras you can quote, but anything that does not resonate with you to the union with the higher, you will not be associated with it. So anything that doesn't help you attune to the Lord, to the higher, to your goal, you will not associate. That is called nitya, anitya, viveka, vicharam. That kind of uh, an attunement, what you do must resonate with the goal. That is Jnana Yoga. So Karma Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, Jnana Yoga. These are the three parts, the three yogas which the Vedas talk. I am not interested in any other yoga that exists out there. So should you be disinterested in any other yoga. The modern gurus are marketing many other yogas. I will blindfold myself to anything other than what the Shastras say. Don't be fooled, don't be swayed by all the so-called modern jagrans of yogas that are mushrooming. Every new guru comes into the market, every new program comes out, a new yoga is being mushroomed, marketed. And just because they have an audience, they become successful. That doesn't make it any more real, please. I'm not attacking anyone. I'm only trying to uphold. They, they, they almost have got it all. The Shastras are not Imperfect. They are complete package by itself. You don't have to go anything beyond it. Don't be sold by anything else. 
karma, bhakti, jnanam. Once you do sufficiently, then he says, japya sameta samadhi vidhanam. Then what you do? The chanting. Practice of chanting and silencing the mind. The practice of chanting refers to meditation. So you can only do meditation only when you have done sufficient karma, sufficient bhakti, sufficient jnanam. That is when you talk of meditation. Today meditation is taught without any mention of these yogas. That doesn't mean you should not sit quietly. Please sit as quietly as you can. But come out more peacefully after sitting quietly. That's more important. I have known people who get more angry after sitting in meditation. So when you sit in meditation, come out more peacefully and more maturely. That's important. So this here is talking about the real meditation where the seeker has completely got rid of his desires. There's no more vasanas because his mind is completely disinterested in the world. Then only when you meditate, you get to the state of silencing of the mind. Absolute silencing of the mind. So when your mind is completely absent, what will happen? When your mind is completely silent, what would happen? That is when you attain moksha, self-realization. At the rate with which we are all meditating, we should have many, many, many multifold millions of Buddhas out there. But I only see Buddhas, no Buddhas anywhere. Why? I know people drop off a hat, they will lose their temper and they get emotional and they'll not talk to you or they'll behave like a child. And they're all Mahagurus out there. What are you talking? Can't be talking, can't be blowing hot and cold. You are like a childishly emotional and they're all gurus on meditation. It can't be, it can't be. Something is not right. Now, this is what Shankaracharya is saying. Kuruvavadhanam, Mahadavadhanam. He repeats it twice. These you must perform with care, with great care. I am only trying to bring out what is there. Nothing of mine is original. Please don't be angry at me. Don't be, don't be dismissive of me. You can dismiss me, but embrace the Shastras. Embrace Adi Shankaracharya. I have got nothing to do with it. I am only conveying what they are saying. He's saying, practice them with care, with great care. He repeats it twice and we are actually paying the price for not heeding their advice. Spirituality has gone off track, gone off rails because we have not heeded their advice. Now what is it? It's care. Now other day, uh, Jama was in the center and uh, uh, we had, she said, uh, Guruji, would you like to have a cup of coffee? I said, yes, ma. I would love to have a cup of coffee. And then she went into the kitchen and came back with a cup of a mug of coffee. Then she asked, how is it? I said, it's wonderful, Ma. Very well. Then I asked, Ma, how much, uh, how much coffee powder do you put for a mug of coffee? She said, Guruji, you should only put one spoon for two cups of coffee. You want more, you put. And then she said, you have to press it if you want in stronger decoction or not that strong. I did not know that all that matters now. Chumma, I, first of all, I did not know where to put other one. One day I put it, I put it in the wrong container and everything started burning. Then I had to do more pranayama to get rid of all the toxin that went in. So that apart, that's my ignorance. Now, as simple as that, all that matters is proportion. Now, I want you all to leave this classroom today. When you think of the verse 30, forget all what I've said in the past 45 minutes. You've got to remember this one word, which is known as proportion. Spiritual growth is nothing but proportioning these three yogas to your spiritual personality and your requirements. Now, my only concern is I have been strongly advised to finish Bajagavindam today. But the look of it, I don't think I'll finish it. May I have the permission to explain this verse? Because everybody is preparing with announcements and everything for Atma Buddha next week. In fact, we have got requests of message also. Guruji, hope you are starting Atma Buddha next week. The look of it, I don't think so. 
do i have the permission to explain this and yeah, nobody is saying anything okay now i must tell you your spiritual growth is boils down to this proportion this last line there is no message in this and he only says be very careful guru vadhanam mahadha vadhanam now what this boils down to is proportion now proportion is about giving yourself the three spiritual practices of karma bhakti gnanam now firstly fundamental question throughout the shastras they only talk of three parts why only three parts let's let's get this clear i am nothing for or against anything let me clarify what why they are given three parts so when you smear your forehead with ash either this way or this way is only three lines isn't it you go through the temple is only three times you take aarti you take three times you are given tirtham the pujari gives three times everything is in triple isn't it why also spiritual path has got only three parts the standard they talk of karma bhakti gnanam why three parts annapurnama i know you are answering to yourself we want to hear your answer <laughs> yes guru ji why are the three path ma uh, frankly i don't think i know okay i appreciate your genuineness okay never mind let's hear from others ashama do you know Oh, no no don't have to be afraid please by all means you can open up no problem there is an opportunity where we all learn yeah just a beginner uh, i am a, a, in fact a little two steps behind you i am also learning so no problem i am still in the nursery class i have not even been enrolled <laughs> i am being considered to enroll or not uh, okay now let's ask others um, santoshma Antosh Birla ma, any idea? No idea, Guru ji. <laughs> no idea. Okay. Uh, Badrina ji, any idea, sir? Uh, okay. Let me try. Please. Yeah. So, Gyana is comprehensive understanding. now if once you have comprehensive understanding it can drive you into suitable action and once you detach yourself from the egotistic aspects of the outcome of the action then it becomes bhakti there cannot be anything other than these three in my mind sir you have captured the entire spirituality in one statement sir <laughs> <laughs> wonderful yes, sir yeah you have, you have conveyed the gist yes the three parts of karma bhakti gnanam are designed because of the three equipments we have of a body mind and intellect that's about all three parts three avenues to explore the truth because you have three equipments you have three vehicles so you can use these three vehicles as a means as an equipment to embark on the journey to get to your own self and that journey of getting to your own self is known as yoga in sanskrit is known as religion in english so when i use my karma my physical body when i use action to get to the self is known as karma yoga i am using the path of action to get to the self when i use my mind to unite with the self is known as the bhakti the path of devotion to discover myself when i'm engaging my intellect in the path of knowledge is known as jnana yoga the path of knowledge in realization of my own self so the three paths because three equipments three means three avenues to realize yourself now every point 2 firstly the three parts because of these three equipments point 2 do you know no two human beings are the same because 
of the combination of permutation of these three equipments. So the proportion of how much physical, how much emotional, how much intellectual you are, is that differentiates between any human being. And no two human beings have the same constitution or same proportion of their physical, emotional and intellectual personalities. Now, Padminima is asking, now does it depend on the three gunas? No. The gunas are only a state of your mind. We are talking of the state of your, of your personality itself. Let's say I, I take Anupurnama. If I take her as a person, she has got a body, mind, intellect. How much of physical personality she is, how much of emotional and how much of intellectual. This is different to the state of mind, which is either sattvic, rajasic, tamasic. That is different. They are two different things. Now, so it is imperative. In fact, spiritual journey begins with knowing your proportion. Whether you are physical, you are physical to what extent? It could be 40% you are physical. It could be 45% you are emotional and 15% intellectual. This is your constitution. So if this is your constitution, what is your spiritual requirement? If I can ask Tinkima, if you are 40% physical, 45% emotional, 15% intellectual, what is your spiritual requirement? I need to build my intellect, use my intellect more so that I can use it to direct the mind. Because if my mind takes over all the I think we lost her. No, mind. when she comes back, we will take her feedback. Srimati Ma, 40% physical, 45% emotional, 15% intellectual. What is my spiritual sadhana? I don't know. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of it the opposite way. Maybe I should exploit my strengths and go for the karma yoga thing, the body, the physical. <coughs> Sorry, could you come again on that statement? I was saying that maybe I should... Uh, the other two that are lower, obviously they need to be brought up. But then I would probably work with the, the strength that I have and try and uh, build on that and then slowly increase the others. All right. You have a point. All right. Let me... Let me receive from as many as I can. Yes, Rajima, you said something. Can you please explain yourself? Guruji, if my, um, if my bhakti uh, proportion is 45%, it would be easier for me to increase that and attain um, moksha uh, rather than try and in increase my intellect portion, which is only 15%. Uh, is that is that a right understanding, so, Guruji? So, would what would you do with the fifteen percent? Make it to zero, huh? <laughs> no, you and take the fifteen percent from there into the mind, huh? What are you advising here? To just increase the uh, the 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 bhakti portion proportion in me to an extent where it leads me to probably uh, the next step of increase the the intellect. All right. Okay. So I've taken step by step. step. All right. Step. Okay. Okay. I've got you. Yes, sir. Okay. Let me take here from Sita Ramanji. Good 
this uh, it is a spiritual quotient is low i have to work on increasing the intellect uh, to get uh, self realization i have to, uh, it should be if it is uh, more than either of them mm. it is 30 30 40 it can be i should work to see fundamentally i have to be devoted and i have to uh, follow if i am a karma yogi i have to follow my karma but my intellect i should go on increasing my spiritual quotient and increase the intellectual quotient as high as possible if, if ultimately if my goal is uh, uh, to rear myself okay okay I, i take note of your answer as well i think tinkima has come back tinkima yeah we lost you would you want to uh, complete your your answer uh you have to unmute yourself ma please okay so if physical is 40 emotional is 45 intellectual is 15 then naturally i would be more in bhakti yoga because that is the higher quotient that i have but i don't know i feel i need to work on the intellectual on the intellect because it's only 15% and i need to build that up because it is the intellect that is going to guide the mind or rein in the mind so that i i do the right actions you know physical the karma should be correct but perhaps when i have this for this proportion naturally perhaps bhakti comes to me more naturally so if my intellectual quotient was maybe 45 and emotional was 15 then i would be more interested in attaining gyan listening to discourses and maybe that bhakti element would be less then i would need to work on that all right glad you could uh, come back and complete your views okay and i would want to hear from as many as people um shivaji any idea i hope uh, we can hear you clearly because uh, last few times your in, your internet was little low your voice was disrupted yeah i think it's okay yeah i got it uh, the internet connection was taken care of now so wonderful yeah we can hear you clearly sir so long ago i think the one which you are which is predominant you need to work on it the strength always one strength is what takes you higher mm. so you, what is predominant only you need to work on that's what i also understand like typically we have had lot of of course in our uh, this thing that, that itihasa that many of them only through bhakti they have attained many of them so whichever is predominant which is your near which is further map possibly you have the possibility is higher with following your natural thing whichever is higher if it could be bhakti or karma that okay. what i understand okay i take your valuable comment sir thank you um gayatri ma any idea i feel that uh, the intellect has to be increased much so that that can divert the mind to the bhakti whatever people are telling bhakti that for that we need the intellect first so the intellect has to be increased so that the mind goes to the bhakti level and physically also karma yoga we do it okay. so in this case if intellect is 15 the mind can go higher anywhere all right okay wonderful i uh, yes sudhakar garu chapandi uh so we can hear you could you un- kindly unmute yourself please yeah yep. the other man, i feel the other way we should have the gyana yoga 100% that is intellect only should prevail in us to take care of everything that is 100% intellect okay uh 
Uh, where is Padmanima? Yeah, Padmanima, can you explain yourself? Uh, Badrinath Ji, we'll just come to you in a minute. Uh, if you have raised your hand. Yeah, just a minute, sir. Padm yes, ma, Padmanima. Yeah, like uh, what I feel is every, every individual is different and their potential is also different. So just leave it like, like that. If I am 40%, I am capable of uh, physical uh, way of approaching spirituality, do that. And then uh, emotional or bhakti, whatever. And uh, rather than trying to uh, do something which is unnatural, because all the three lead to the same thing. So why should you disturb it and uh, seek something which is hard to get? Rather than that, go choose your own ways of doing things. But the goal should be that. All right. Uh, I take note of that. Okay. Uh, Badrinath Ji. Sir, we can't hear you. Could you please unmute, sir? Yeah. I had something similar as what Padmini Madam said. You basically act without conflict. And if you have a certain proportion, first of all, you don't know these exact proportions. <laughs> so you, you come to know of it only when there is conflict in the way you act. And therefore, if you choose the path of least conflict, you will automatically go towards where your uh, tendencies are. And uh, that is the best way to express yourself, I thought. Wonderful. In fact, I, I was very keen in hearing from all of you, as many of you all I can, any, any more from comments as well, I'd be happy to hear. But I'm glad I have not rushed through this very, very important section. In fact, I would say only Padminima and Badrinath Ji have made sense to me. All of you who else have said are completely wrong completely wrong. I have to be very upright in saying which is chalk, which is cheese. And this is what will really ensure whether you spiritually grow or not. If you noted what I started by saying, these three parts are three avenues to get to the truth which means you can get to the truth in any one avenue, isn't it? There are three parts, three means to get to the same goal. So all three are getting to the same goal of realization, which is moksha, you can call it nirvana, you can call it God realization, self-realization, becoming Brahman, the totality. You can name it what it is, but they all lead us to the one truth. And I said, no two human beings are the same, all of us are different because of the proportion. So each one of us has a unique proportion, which is what I am, which is not what you are. And which, so all the necessary data you needed to answer the question was already pre-given in the little intro I gave about this concept. So if you had carefully measured what I had said, each one is unique. Each of these are three parts which take us to, this, to the truth. And everyone is essential composition of all the three. Nobody is exclusive. All of us have to have all the three because we have all the three equipments. Isn't it? Now, to change this proportion is to tamper with the original software I'm born with. is to go through my entire blood transfusion unless and until I've got a terminal cancerous disease, I've got blood cancer. Then I would go through an extreme measure of doing transfusion, isn't it? Otherwise, what my blood, if I am B positive or A positive or O positive, whatever, that's what I am. Why should I go about changing what blood group am I? Why should I go about changing what sex am I? If I'm born as a male, let me live as a male. There are certain perverted people who want to go to change their from male to a female and female to a male. They will want to change this and change that. Psychopaths. Don't you all, you and I think that way when you're born, God has given you this embodiment with because you have certain vasanas. You have a certain personality. 
just let it flourish through what you have. Why would you want to change other than what you are? Isn't it as absurd and as perverted it would be to change you what sex you are? Exactly the same way. It is illogical, impractical, unspiritual to change your proportion which you're born with. You're born with this vasanas. You're born with this proportion. You can use this proportion wisely and get rid of your vasanas and attain realization. You have to go through your proportion. You got to make wise use of what you are given with rather than unwisely wanting to change the proportion, which in itself is a lifetime effort. Mark my words, I repeated, make wise use of what you are given with than being unwise in wanting to change your proportion. Therefore, it is very, very, very important and imperative before you embark on your journey, find out what resources I have, what proportion am I, what kind of a human being am I? So based on the proportion, I will not change the example, 40% karma, 45 emotional, 15% intellectual, then to that extent you must give that specific practices. So if you're 40% karma, you must expose yourself more to the physical karma seva. Since you're 45% emotional, you've got to give yourself that much more devotion. And since you're 15% intellectual, you've got to give yourself 15% of inclination towards scriptural study and literature. Now, your proportion, my proportion is different. If my proportion is 60% intellectual, that means 60% of my time of spirituality is spent on study and reflection and shastras. That's all. I'm all the time caught up in the books and intellectual study of the literature. But if I'm only got 15% of intellection, I can't be giving out this knowledge and devote my life towards teaching the shastras. It's not possible because I only have that much time to it. I'm more towards field work. And yet I know people. In fact, I remember uh, meeting a uh, very fine, very pure uh, a gentleman. In fact, Sridhar Ramanji, Vasantamai have introduced me a few times. I happened to meet him as well. Lovely gentleman, but he's a great karma yogi. He'll go from, he has given up his job. He has given up his future. He, 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 he lives on bare minimum so much so that he will, if he is coming to your house, he will not even have enough money in his pocket to take a, a cab. He'll come in a public transport or he'll walk most of the distance. He'll not have enough me, money to buy a meal. He'll come home and have a meal with you. And yet at the same time, he's generating crores of rupees. He has got such contacts, such potential. He is raising millions of dollars for the causes he believes in. And yet he is such a simple, straightforward, hardworking karma yogi. He met me. We understood each other. I clearly understood his proportion. He is not interested in jnanam. He is a karma yogi. So it is foolish on my part to sit and give a lecture to him and say, the highest truth is Vedanta, Sanadra Dharma, eternal principles, blah, blah, blah. It will not enter his head. He is perhaps far more spiritual than me. But he is a karma yogi. That is his proportion. So just because you are jnani doesn't mean you are superior to a person who is a bhakta or a karma yogi. Please get that right today. Please understand that today. So whatever your proportion, you got to give in to that proportion. You got to cater to that proportion. That is when, what will happen? That is when the coffee will taste well. Not you spiritually grow. Remember the example, your coffee will matter how much of sugar, how much of milk, how much of decoction. That is the perfect combination of a perfect coffee. And then you've got to brew it rightly so in the right proportion, you get the wonderful coffee to drink. Similarly, you will spiritually grow only when you give in to your proportion. So it's important. You should know your proportion. And that is what is said. 
Puruvavadhanam, Mahadavadhanam. There is no need otherwise for the Shankaracharya to say this because he has already mentioned karma, bhakti, jnanam. He has already mentioned of meditation. But if this is not done in the right proportion, in the right time, in the right stage, you will not evolve. As simple as you have bought a beautiful vehicle, but yet your vehicle will not give you the adequate performance and the mileage and efficiency until it goes into the first servicing, isn't it? It goes to the workshop. And when it goes to the first servicing, they will do all that fine adjustments of tuning the engine, changing the oil and whatever fine tuning they do. And once that fine tuning is done, he says, sir, now fill in the petrol from empty tank to empty tank and come and tell me, how is your vehicle performing? Is it giving you adequate mileage and so on and so forth? That is when you will perform. So performance is like fine tuning. And this is what is fine tuning. Now you are having 40% karma, you're spending 80% in karma. You are 45% bhakti, you're spending 70% time in bhakti. So you are lopsided spiritual personalities out there. Spirituality has become lopsided. You're only doing one aspect of it. Imagine when I go and exercise, I'm only exercising my right arm. My left arm is not exercised at all. Or I'm only exercising my lower arm, not my upper arm. Or only my left side and not my right side. Will I not become a caricature? Will I not be a lopsided spirit, physical development? Spiritual personality, spiritual development needs to be given to your spiritual requirements. So drop the idea of changing the proportion. Pick up the idea of finding out what your proportion is. Put your heads to it to find out what kind of a person am I? Am I more inclined towards action? Am I more inclined towards emotion? Am I more drawn towards intellection? And if so, to what extent am I drawn? How much of my time and energy is, in, in, is drawn to it? That is your natural self. As Badrinaji said and Padmini also said, why should I want to change? I am, I am a beautiful personality, which is what I am born with. This is your past karma. You are born that way. You are, don't ask why and don't think of changing it. Just respect it, understand it, and then give pra, pranayamam, pratyaharam, Nitya, Nitya, Viveka, Vicharam. So when you do these three with keeping your proportion in mind, ultimately you come to a state where you can do Japya Sameta Samadhi Vidanam, where you can chant and then silence the mind to attain Moksha realization. I tell you, these people have something to say to mankind. They have said for generations, humanity is going to be definitive. But if in order for me to convey this, I need to devote my entire life to understand them. It is not possible. Believe me, it's not possible. I do it even for my living. I can't even think of my own livelihood if I want to come and teach this knowledge to you all. So therefore, I don't do anything for my livelihood. I'm not interested. I'm not advertising, nor am I seeking any support or help. I'm only trying to tell you there's so much this knowledge has to offer. Someone has to burn his life just to do justice to this great wisdom. Otherwise, I can just believe me, I could have wrapped up the Bhaju Govindam, not now. Ten weeks ago, I could have wrapped it up. The Mudia, it's not something I can do it. I would not want to rush through it. What I want is your evolution. And, it, it, and to, to bring that out, you need to pause and examine. And that's all we have done. See, the most innocuous words in the verse convey the most in the verse. We have heard of karma, bhakti, jnana many a time. But why does he say it? Kurvavadhanam, Mahadavadhanam. My humble prostration is to this great man. Otherwise it's impossible. impossible. We have just shot a mark of time. Hariji, if it's a short thing, yes, certainly you have something to say. Please. Unless, if you don't mind, we can take it up the following week. Okay. Thank you for your understanding. Okay. Sorry, Rajima, is there something to say? Guruji, for, yeah. with your permission, for some of who, uh, you who joined in late and have missed the announcement, we are Yes, yes, ma'am, please go ahead. We are posting the details of the account number 
where you could express your love and gratitude to Guruji. We will also be posting these details of the satsang group. Harishji? Yeah. We have it on the screen now. Uh, if you could just take a screenshot, it'll be nice. I will also be posting the same on, on the uh, satsang group. Harium. Om. Pur Namada. Pur Namidam. Pur Nat. Pur Namudachate. Pur Nasya. Pur Namadaya. Pur Nameva Vashishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om